Do we have a closing right signal? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Hello? It's still moving, right? Hello? Hello? Oh, okay, yeah, it works. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ren Sius. Is it Sius or Sis? Sis. Sis, okay. Sorry about it. <laughs> Ren Sis. So, uh, Ren uh, uh, did her PhD at UC Berkeley, and now she is a Hubble Fellow at Stanford University, and she's moving uh, to a faculty position at uh, UC Boulder in uh, the fall. Uh, so, Ren is working on observational uh, galaxy formation and evolution. So, this talk will be very unusual for this crowd, uh, and I think it, it's great because it will help people work on theory uh, to stay in touch with reality and <laughs> generate uh, a lot of discussion after the talk. So please welcome uh, Ren. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and, and thanks for having me. I have never actually been here in person, which at this point in my career feels very weird. I think I've been here on Zoom during the pandemic a few times, but it's great to actually be in your maze of a building and see it in person and, and all that and meet everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm Ren, so I am very much an observer. Um, so I'll be talking today uh, mostly about this uh, medium bands mega science survey um, that I'm leading. That's a JWST cycle two uh, medium band imaging uh, survey. And I wanted to just uh, sort of start by introducing the context of, of how I kind of uh, think about uh, my role as an observational astronomer, which is that what we really care about when we're trying to understand distant galaxies is, is their physical properties. We want to be able to measure their masses and ages and star formation rates and their dust content. And the issue is that all we actually can see is light. And so we need some way to interpret these multiband observations of light that we see and back out the correct physical properties. Um, and so the way that, that we mostly do this as observers is to take images at many different wavelengths this is an example of just a, of a spiral galaxy or a, I guess, face-on disk galaxy um, seen by HST at a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, so we take all these multiband images, and then the thing that we typically do is we just plunk some big aperture around the whole galaxy. Um, oftentimes, for very distant galaxies, they're not quite this beautiful and spatially resolved, though that is changing now in the era of JWST, as I'll show you. Uh, but typically what we do, again, is just sum up all of the light in some aperture. And then we turn every one of these images into a single point on a spectral energy distribution. So flux density is a function of wavelength. So these uh, you know, six or seven images get turned into six or seven data points on this plot. And then once you have that, you can fit a stellar population synthesis model um, to these points and back out the physical properties. Um, I realize this is review to many of you who are involved in building many of these models, but I wanted to just sort of uh, emphasize this because these models are really complicated, right? So they encode basically everything that we think that we know about how stars form and evolve, um, what stars of certain ages and metallicities actually look like in terms of their spectra, and then all sorts of galaxy stuff, so how many stars a galaxy forms over time, and then how all of that starlight is, is reprocessed um, by the effects of dust. And so there's a ton of different knobs that you can turn in these models. Uh, and again, we're fitting to usually just a couple of data points. And uh, yeah, so basically when we're talking on an observational side, most everything that we know about galaxies in the distant universe relies on this type of modeling in some, in some way, whether or not we're fitting photometry or spectra. Um, and so this is really sort of the backbone of how we understand um, our observable universe. And so what that really fundamentally means is that any time we can improve our understanding of this diagram, so any time we can put better, deeper data or cover new parts of the wavelength regime um, or look at higher resolution data, it can actually really dramatically impact our understanding of the properties of distant galaxies and in turn really affect our understanding of, uh, of the you know, whole effectively evolution of, of galaxies across cosmic time. So uh, this is my segue into I, I really don't need at this point um, to show you another GIF about how great JWST is, but I'm going to because uh, I still am just like wowed every time I look at this. Um, so this is actually, this is fading uh, from Spitzer to Miri. So one of our best views um, before JWST of, of the mid-infrared universe. And you can just see how incredible the improvement is in terms of resolution and depth where just all of these faint sources are popping up above the noise that we were never able to observe. 
And then I picked this one because it also has this like beautiful extended structure that you can see resolved in just this gorgeous detail. And so in terms of you know, this diagram that I was just talking about, basically what this new telescope allows us to do um, is really sort of push into the infrared part of the, into the spectrum. And then also at higher redshift, um, we were really only able to see the rest frame optical at cosmic noon. And so we were losing a huge amount of information about the physics of galaxies in the distant universe. And there's really a whole uh, sort of swath of cosmic history that's open to us for the first time. And so the, the question is how we actually use this. So now that we have this new telescope that's opening up these huge parts of the wavelength regime and, and redshift space to observations for kind of the first time, how do we actually put together a new understanding of our universe given that new data? Um, I was told that there should be 30 minutes of discussion after this, so I figured I should put at least one sort of discussion question up here, which is like, how do we actually sort of start to build um, this, this understanding and how do we effectively use telescope time in order to go from this kind of era where we're just looking at a couple weird objects to actually putting together a statistical picture of the distant universe. And so I wanted to start by saying basically the most common survey strategy in early JWST observations, um, not that this is a bad strategy at all, it's just the strategy that most people are taking, uh, is to start by taking imaging with JWST NearCam that basically lets you identify sources that you think are interesting in some way, and then to put slits on them and follow up anything that you think is interesting with spectroscopy. And the reason that people do this mostly is that this NearCam imaging that people are taking lets you do a lot of statistics. You're getting, I think, something like 10,000 objects per, per NearCam pointing, depending on exactly uh, what you're looking at and to what depth. Um, and then you know, you're following a, something like 100 objects at a time with NearSpec, where you're getting a lot more detailed information, but a, a much smaller number of galaxies. Um, and so to, to push a little bit on this first part about NearCam imaging, almost everybody in cycle one had the same survey strategy, um, which is a relatively conservative strategy. So um, these are the filters that are on the NearCam instrument. So this is uh, basically the wavelength as a function of, of uh, this is the filter transmission. Um, and so you can see basically these, these are all covering these little parts of wavelength space and you're summing up all the flux in the galaxy across those different filters. Um, and so the trade-off is basically as you go towards these, these filters that are covering larger parts of wavelength space, you're effectively averaging over the flux from a larger part of the galaxy's spectrum. So it's more likely that you're going to get some strong line or something and you're going to have a detection of that galaxy. And then as you go down here, you're getting more detailed information. So you can tell exactly what's happening at you know, 3.23 or whatever this filter is at. Um, and so the, the strategy that most people have taken is to kind of go for these broadband filters that are kind of a good mix between giving you some information about what's happening in the galaxy, but also giving you a lot of flux and a lot of detections. And then most surveys have also added in this single medium band filter, 410M, um, which pre-JWST this was basically predicted to give you the most constraining power on photometric redshifts. So that's what almost every survey did. Um, but broadband photometry can be confusing. Um, so I figured I would pick an example where I, I picked on myself instead of somebody else, um, which is that uh, early in the summer, um, after the first uh, JWST data dropped, we found these really weird galaxies in some of the Sears imaging. And then if you look at their, their SED, it looks like they're very massive galaxies at very early cosmic times. Um, this caused, I think, more of a hubbub than we were potentially expecting. Um, and it turns out there's many different ways to interpret these same you know, seven or eight photometric data points. And so one um, alternative explanation that, that people came up with in this paper from, from Ryan Ensley is that maybe actually this is all extreme emission line boosting. We didn't really know um, until we eventually started taking spectra of these things. And it turns out they're not stellar populations at all. These are just AGN that we're seeing at lower redshifts. Um, and they're weird AGN that weren't really included in our models. And so basically uh, the point I'm trying to make is that when you're, when you're looking at uh, this sort of new view of the universe that has objects that are potentially not in your model space, it's really hard to interpret with uh, just seven data points what exactly you're looking at. And you can very easily become confused. Um, and spectroscopy is amazing. Um, it's also very time consuming and very targeted. And what that means in this early data era is that our, um, 
People are now starting to do more uniform selection functions, but for the first year or two of data, the selection function was basically one of 50 people on the team decided that this thing was cool. And you can't really put that into a statistical understanding of the universe because you have to you know, put together some model of what all of these different people thought was cool and then sort of modulo that by what ended up getting a mask. And it becomes very difficult to build a statistical understanding of what's out there. Um, but there's two sort of in-between observing modes that you can do that get you more information per object, but still let you look at many objects at once. Um, and the first one is GRISM spectroscopy. Um, so basically the idea is that instead of taking an image, you just disperse the light. It's dispersed this way, and you basically get a spectrum for everything that's in your image instead of just a couple things that you decided to put a slit on. Um, GRISM spectroscopy is great, especially with JWST. It's actually very, um, very high resolution compared to what we had on, on HST. Um, there's a lot of really excellent programs. This, this figure is from um, Pascal Ush, who's leading the, the Fresco program, but there's others as well. And so you basically get a spectrum for everything that's in your field, um, but you're mostly sensitive just to emission lines, so you can really only look at star-forming galaxies, and that's mostly because all of your spectra are overlapping. And so you generally have to filter out the continuum in, in order to be able to tell which object a line is even really coming from. Um, and so the other survey strategy is to go back to looking at this sort of diagram of what are the filters that we have in terms of imaging on NearCam and realize that there's this, it's not just F410M, there's this huge set of medium band filters. And if you actually observe all of these simultaneously for the same set of, um, of uh, galaxies, you get something like a resolving power of 8 to 30, depending on exactly what redshift you're looking at. Um, and the, the bonus of this, um, as opposed to GRISM, is that you're sensitive to both line emission and continuum emission. So you can look at older stellar populations, and you can look at quiescent galaxies. And then also, this is just imaging. So you have maps of everything. So you can actually map out the physical properties of distant, of distant galaxies. And so this is the survey strategy that we've been taking with this new um, medium bands mega science program, um, which is mostly what I'll be telling you about today. Um, this is part of the Uncover survey. Um, so Uncover is a, uh, it was a cycle one treasury program. It's an ultra deep early JWST um, community deep field. Um, so all of the data is immediately public. Um, it's in the ABLE 2744 lensing cluster. So this is, a, this is a, the near cam broadband imaging for, for Uncover. All of these things that are white, this is the foreground cluster. It's at about a redshift of 0.3. This is one of the Hubble frontier fields. Um, so there's HST coverage. Um, there's actually a huge amount of, of other data in this field. Um, and Uncover is a, a huge team of a lot of really wonderful folks that I wanted to highlight. Um, so in particular, the PIs of the, of the first um, sort of round of Uncover are Ivo Labe and Rachel Bazanson. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of really incredible uh, junior people that are leading really key parts of the analysis who I wanted to highlight. Uh, in particular, our survey manager, Sedona Price, who's a postdoc at Pitt. Um, John Weaver at UMass has been doing all of our photometric catalogs on like extraordinarily, impressively rapid turnaround. Um, Bingji Wang is, is doing prospector modeling of all of, our, all of the galaxies in our field. And then uh, Sam Cutler and Richard Pan, who are grad students, have also been playing key roles in figuring out the PSFs, which are a pain for the medium bands. Um, and then also uh, Richard has been painstakingly subtracting out all these foreground cluster galaxies so we could get nice clean measurements of these, these galaxies in the background. Um, so the first sort of uh, act of this Uncover survey um, is, is pre-imaging with, uh, with these broadband filters. Um, so this is the, just a map of the field. And like I said, it overlaps with sort of existing HST pointing from, this, uh, from the Hubble frontier fields. Um, there's also MUSE spectroscopy in the cluster core. And then it's also the target of several other early JWST programs. In particular, like up there in the corner is the GLASS ERO program. There is a DDT observation in this field. There have been many, many observations so far. Um, I don't know, the tank keeps giving us time in this field, and I'm, I'm not going to question it. Um, so there's something like 60,000 objects in our, in our first catalog. Um, and all of this is, is totally public. So um, you know, I think most of you are probably theorists, given this audience. But if you want to play with data, um, everything is there. So all of the mosaics, the photometry, easy fits, prospector fits, uh, magnification maps for the cluster are, are all on our website. And I'm happy to sort of guide people through the data products if you're interested in using them. 
Um, the second sort of act of, of uncover is, like I said, follow-up spectroscopy. Um, so this is, this is basically um, a paper that's led by Sedona Price that's about to come out, like maybe next week or so. This is just a stack of all of, our, of, all of the spectra that we took. Um, it's something like 600 prism spectra, or 700, I guess. We have to reobserve one mask that failed. Um, and there's already been a number of papers on the spectra on, on a bunch of different topics that I don't have time to, time to talk about, but we have a lot of really cool objects in here. Um, and this is really a wonderful, wonderful data set. The prism spectra are really gorgeous. Um, and so the sort of third act of this is our cycle two program that I'm leading, um, which is a medium band survey covering the same exact imaging field. And so the, so the idea here, mm, like I said, is just to get all of these medium band filters and really fill in this photometric coverage of this field in order to better model these stellar populations of these distant galaxies. Um, so this is our primary pointing. Um, so we're, yeah, basically adding in these, these dozen photometric filters, including these two bluest um, FO70 and FO90 that were missing from the original uncovered data set, um, which is really good for selecting very high redshift um, dropout objects and then filling in all of these medium band filters. Um, we're ours, we also have uh, parallel observations in an adjacent field with NIRAS, where again, we're just really filling in this, this coverage of these filters. Um, and so in terms of this diagram that I was showing earlier, basically the thing that we're doing is we're not extending the wavelength range at all. It's still just one to five microns, but we're really filling in um, these data points going from about, I think it's seven to 20 um, points of photometry. And so there just becomes much less wiggle room to move around this model and, and you can actually really pin down the physical properties of all of these galaxies quite well. Um, so our data was acquired in November, um, like over Thanksgiving break, I think on Thanksgiving actually, I had to write a whopper for our first observation failed. It was not very fun, I also had COVID. It was a whole saga, we have all of our data, which is amazing. We have a really great program coordinator, Shelly Myatt, who really helped a lot with that. Um, I also, since I mentioned um, GRISM observations as another mode, there was actually a GRISM program in the same exact field that was also um, approved in cycle two. So this is um, called All the Little Things. It's led by Yorit Matei and, and Rohan Naidu, um, which is also covering the same exact field. So we have a ton of new data on this, on this same part of the sky. And so our first goal of the survey is to do sort of uh, this, you know, improved understanding of the, of the redshifts and masses and star formation rates of these distant galaxies. And so here I'm just showing you basically um, the improvement in a couple just example SED fits. Um, so the left is from Uncover, our original observations. And so you can see the photometry and then the, the light blue is a model fit to that. Um, and then in the middle is adding in these dozen new filters from mega science. And then on the right is the, the photometric redshift that you get out. And so you can see that basically you're mitigating um, one of the most confusing things in, in understanding the photometry of distant galaxies, which is whether or not the break in the spectrum that you're seeing is the Lyman break or the Balmer break. And we're able to resolve that really well with mega science in particular because there's so many strong emission lines in the rest frame optical that if you have a dozen medium band filters, you're almost always going to get at least one strong line in a medium band and you're gonna be able to really pin down the redshift. Uh, we can also disentangle line versus continuum emission. Um, this is a really fun example because in the uncover data, this, looks, this galaxy basically just looks like this rising red continuum with, with very little information until you look at the mega science data and you realize that almost every single one of these points is really contaminated by line emission. It's basically just this, I think, F300M filter that's actually tracing the real continuum in the galaxy. And so again, you before got the redshift totally wrong, and now you get it almost exactly on the spectroscopic redshift. And then the last example is, again, there's just really no wiggle room now that you have all of these photometric filters, and so you're able to really reduce the error bars on, on all of your photometric redshifts. So what this looks like on aggregate, going from our original sort of seven band photometry with Uncover, this is our um, photometric redshift performance. So basically this is uh, as a function of the actual spectroscopic redshift of the galaxy, what is the photometric redshift we would have inferred. Um, and this is using uh, our own uh, spectroscopic redshifts, which are, are in this paper that's coming out soon from Sedona Price. So our performance with the original uncovered data set was like not, not terrible, but when you add in these dozen extra bands of photometry, um, you essentially, all of these points just collapse down onto that one-to-one -one line just about. 
Um, so we have uh, about a 3x uh, improvement in our photometric redshift error and uh, a 2x improvement in, in our outlier fraction. And most of these catastrophic outliers, I've looked at them, they're like right in the, we have this one star in the center of the cluster that has these giant diffraction spikes. And most of these should be flagged because the photometry is like right in a diffraction spike. So I should probably do that before we, before we publish this paper, but I have not yet. Um, and so the, the key thing is that uh, a lot of this science that you're doing down the line with uh, inferring stellar masses and, and star formation rates and all of this stuff, this all really depends on getting the photometric redshift right. And so by improving the precision of our redshifts by about a factor of three, we're really affecting all of this science that we can do in this field down the line and really reducing the error bars on basically any measurement that we want to make of galaxy scaling relations by similar factors of something like two to three. Um, and then the second main science goal that I want to talk about is, is going back to this idea that in the distant universe, usually what we do is we just turn these beautiful images into each into a single data point and put it on one, one plot. And instead try to move towards a spatially resolved understanding and not just, you know, uh, understand the physics of the whole galaxy, but look at how the physical properties vary um, with the location in the galaxy. Um, and so these medium bands can also, they're really effective at mapping strong features across a wide redshift range. Um, so this is just showing how these different strong emission features kind of move through redshift space um, for these different medium band filters. And the really key thing here is that basically any redshift that you care about, any place on this x-axis you are, you're uh, probing multiple strong lines simultaneously. So for example, if you're really interested in dust, we have a big chunk of redshift space where you get both H alpha, passion beta, and passion alpha. So many different lines that you can compare and try and map out these, these physical properties of these galaxies. Um, so most of the rest of the talk, it's, it's very dark in here. You all look awake, but it's very dark because I mostly wanted to show you a lot of pretty pictures. Um, so we're going to start at low redshift and then work our way up. Um, so starting in the cluster itself, ABLE 2744 at redshift 0.3. Um, we're tracing both passion alpha and the 3.3 micron pa for all cluster galaxies. And so all these images that I'm going to show you, um, this leftmost image is a, is a broadband image. So this is just a sum of all of, the, all the data from the original uncover survey. And then we have a dozen medium band filters, which divides up nicely into four three color images. So I'm just showing you the images here. These are not PSF matched. These are not continuum subtracted. This is just like right out of the telescope. Um, most of the cluster galaxies look like this. They're, I mean, they're very pretty, but they're not like super exciting in terms of looking at these medium band filters because they have, they're all quiescent and they have very flat SEDs. Um, but there's also some really weird galaxies in the cluster. Um, so for example, this thing actually has a name. This is the Firework Galaxy. Uh, and you can see basically this uh, lighting up in green here, all these little bits of space. This is actually uh, the Passion Alpha line. Um, so this is indicating star forming regions within the galaxy that are spatially resolved. Um, and then this 3.3 micron PA feature, this is a, this is a dust emission feature in the rest frame, um, I guess, mid infrared, um, which is actually sitting right between this 410M and 430M filter. So you can see this galaxy is like bright pink and then bright blue in these two color images. Um, and already just by eye, you can see something about uh, the fact that this dust emission and the star formation is, is spatially correlated. Um, we have, this is, a, this is a really fun one. This is a galaxy. So the cluster is here. This galaxy is here as so it's falling in. And then it's igniting star formation just on that, on that far edge of the galaxy. Um, and there's many examples that we, that we can look at here. Um, if, if anybody is a cluster person, please let me know. I don't know what to do with these. Um, it's really gorgeous data, but uh, we're all mostly cosmic noon and above uh, people in my collaboration. So if anybody is interested in this data, um, yeah, come talk to me. Um, so at, at higher redshift, we start to probe these sort of rest optical lines. Um, I love this example of this galaxy that looks like a nice disk, and then you see H alpha emission just lighting up like a little disco ball um, out in the, in the star forming arms of this thing. Um, this is a triply imaged galaxy um, that was spectroscopically confirmed by Muse, where you see these little clumps lighting up in all of these different strong lines simultaneously, including actually passion beta, you can see emission in this thing. 
Um, there's really dust obscured galaxies where you can see this, this core of this galaxy is totally dark in the blue and then lights up by the time you get out to Passion Beta. Um, there's just a lot going on in all of these images. Um, so as an example of the type of science that you can do, um, I wanted to show you a couple maps of dust. And so I'm taking a few galaxies that are spectroscopically confirmed. Um, so this is an example at 2.7, I guess. Um, and here I'm just showing the spectrum from Uncover. And I'm highlighting three medium bands. The first one is this one that's in green. That's the covering the H alpha line. And then the two uh, medium bands just surrounding it, which we can use as continuum. Um, so as, if you take a median of those, of those two, um, the blue and the red filter with the PSF convolved um, imaging, you can basically make a map of the continuum around the H alpha line. And then you can subtract it off of that green medium band filter to get just a map of where the H alpha emission is happening inside the galaxy in a spatially resolved way. And again, this is a galaxy that's at like almost redshift three. It's kind of wild that you can make these maps in this much detail at this high of a redshift. Um, the lensing boost actually really helps here. We can get down to, to kiloparsec resolution pretty easily in many of these things. Um, and then you can do the same exact thing for the passion beta line. And here I've scaled these two line maps by the intrinsic ratio of, of passion beta to H alpha. Um, and so basically the idea is that if there was no dust in this galaxy, these two maps should look identical. And like they very obviously do not, um, just by eye, which is telling you that this galaxy has a, has a lot of dust throughout, especially at the center. Um, and just as a couple other examples, um, this is a really fun one where you can see that there's basically this hole in the H alpha map where you don't see any H alpha emission at all from the center of the galaxy, but it's very bright in passion beta which is showing you this galaxy core that's almost completely obscured by dust, um, which is a thing that you know, we, th we think happens, that the centers of galaxies are probably more dust obscured if they've just undergone a starburst. It's not necessarily surprising, but the thing that's really cool is that you can just do this um, very easily from this data for you know, thousands of galaxies and really build up this statistical idea of how, how these things are happening in a spatially resolved way. Uh, and then one last example of, of a galaxy that's almost completely obscured by dust. You can see all of this emission in passion beta that's just completely dark in H alpha. Um, so these are just a couple sort of very simple um, examples. Um, we're working on doing a actually sort of statistical understanding of the spatially resolved properties of dust in these cosmic noon galaxies. Um, that's being led by, by Brian Lorenz, who's a, a grad student at Berkeley. Um, and then moving up towards higher redshifts in the survey, um, so this is the, I don't know what to call what's above cosmic noon and below reionization. If anybody has thoughts, that can be another potential discussion topic. Here I've called it cosmic morning, something like redshift four to six, where again, we're getting all of these really strong optical features, a lot of O2 and H beta plus O3 in these data. And uh, these are all so weird. Like it's very hard to look at any of the galaxies in our survey once you have all these medium band filters and not find something that's clumpy and strange and very spatially resolved. Um, and so I guess another discussion topic is, is for the simulators is can you make galaxies that look like this at, at redshift six? I, the answer is probably yes, but um, it's, it's a fun comparison data set. And you can do almost by eye uh, emission line ratios. Like you can see, for example, in, in this one, um, the center is very bright in O2 and very faint in H alpha. So you know that something is going on different in the center of the galaxy than the outskirts with the, with the physical properties. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, another science topic, um, which is spatially resolving uh, the very first quiescent galaxies. Um, so this is a paper that was led by David Seton um, in Uncover, where he was following up on some very red sources in this, in this spectroscopy. And he found this galaxy at about redshift four that has a very strong Balmer break and very weak H alpha, which indicates it's, it's not very actively forming new stars. Um, and the spectral fitting of this galaxy, uh, which he did with Prospector, shows that this thing formed really early. Um, so basically, this is, this is David's galaxy. And then this is all other sort of quiescent galaxies that have been known so far. So this is one of the fastest forming galaxies that we think we've discovered to date. Um, in these JW observations. Um, and so he went and started to look at the spatially resolved photometry of this. Um, this was before we got the mega science data. Um, but even with just those seven filters, um, he's looking at the core of the galaxy here and then marching out in annuli. And you can see the shape of this spectrum totally change going from the inside at the, at the top um, to, the, to the outside here. 
Um, and so the question is, like, why? So what is different about the inside of the galaxy than the outskirts? Um, and so the, the obvious answers are either it's, it's redder, so either it has to be um, older or it has to be dustier um, or, or metal content, um, which is harder to tell. Um, and it turns out that at, at, for this galaxy at Redshift 4, um, you actually can't make uh, a stellar population that is uh, red enough to uh, explain the, the core of this galaxy via uh, star formation alone because the universe is just too young for there to be stars that are red, old and red enough. And so it turns out that you actually need to have significant dust content in the center of this galaxy in order to explain this. Um, and this is confirmed when he does spatially resolved SED fitting. But again, this is just seven points of photometry. And once we add in the, the data um, from mega science, these additional 12 bands, um, we get much, much tighter constraints. Um, so he actually hasn't refit the same exact galaxy. But this is an example of a different quiescent galaxy um, in our sample where you can't play this same trick of it's at a little bit lower redshift. So you can't just break this age dust degeneracy by being like, well, the universe is really young. Um, so you have to actually model it. Um, so this is work led by Jared Segel at, at Princeton. Um, where again, now we have 20, 20 bands of photometry, you can do this spatially resolved SED fitting and actually be confident about your answer. And so here, he's really showing that you can break this age dust degeneracy in this, in this quiescent galaxy and understand why these things seem to be forming in this sort of inside out way. Um, there's a lot of examples of quiescent galaxies in our, in our survey, and he's finding a big diversity of these color gradients. So they're not all dusty on the inside and, and not dusty on the outside. Some of them are not dusty throughout. Um, this is potentially an evolutionary sequence that things go through as they quench. We're still, um, again, we've had the data for like three months, so we're still putting together a statistical understanding. And then um, just lastly, at the, at the highest redshifts, you can continue to make these really cool maps um, of emission lines. And this is just showing you three examples of these are spectroscopically confirmed galaxies all at about redshift 6.3. Um, so this is during the epoch of reionization, we're making maps of the O3 line emission in these galaxies, which is like very, very cool. Um, and uh, not all of them are point sources. I think I, I personally expected basically everything at high redshift to just look like a point source, um, but they're not. Um, these in particular are extremely clumpy. Um, and you can see by eye, again, where the continuum emission is coming from and where the line emission coming, is coming from are very different in these galaxies. And so this is indicating already at these very early cosmic times, you have this complex picture of how these galaxies are assembling and forming um, and potentially mergers are very important, or at least the things that are merging are bright, and so we can see them. Um, so just as, as a way of summary, I'll talk a little bit about the science goals that we're most excited about with this survey. Um, so first is really just doing this, this spatially integrated science and really improving our photometric redshifts and stellar masses and et cetera, all of these properties um, by factors of already in our first data release um, before we've kind of optimized all of, our, all of our processing. We're already improving these by factors of something like two to three. Um, and then also, I'm really excited about moving towards this era where we're going beyond just looking at the integrated properties of galaxies. And we're also starting to map out the physical properties of galaxies in a spatially resolved way and start to build a sort of systematic picture of how galaxies are, um, are, are growing across um, most of cosmic history. Um, and then something I didn't have time to talk about um, much is that, again, we have basically all of the data except for MIRI in this field now. And so I think this is a really great place to try and calibrate our understanding of the telescope um, and compare different modes. So what is the answer that you get if you have spectra versus medium band photometry versus GRISM data? And how does that actually impact all of our, our um, sort of inferences about the universe down the line once we're looking at how that data um, uh, is used. So uh, that's all I have. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Uh, it's great to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Questions? So there is a very interesting test that you might be able to do. Um, yeah. uh, being agnostic about standard cosmology, mm -hmm. <coughs> if you fit for the redshifts, yep and fit for the best age of each galaxy, you can see that the upper envelope for the age tracks the age of the universe versus redshift without assuming it. So in other words, mm. if you tell 
<laughs> the analyzers uh, that mm -hmm. the universe is that age, they will always try to suppress models that favor a, a, a larger age. But mm -hmm. it would be nice to do it agnostically and see that the standard cosmology is respected, mm -hmm. especially because of the Hubble tension. Yeah. And we don't know what if the Hubble tension is real, and if, mm -hmm. if it, it is, what is response? So it could be that at some high redshift, there's some un unusual physics going on. Mm -hmm. It would be just nice, since you have so many galaxies with su such uh, great data, mm -hmm. Have you looked into that or checked the age yeah. versus redshift? Yeah, so I haven't made that exact plot. We we do have um, we have a, several different sets of stellar population fitting, and in particular, um, we fit for photos Ds assuming physical priors, which is basically the thing that you're suggesting that we don't do, um, which mostly affects the quiescent galaxies. Um, it, we have a lot of very um, uh, quiescent galaxies that if you, if you don't let the suppress uh, the templates at very early times, they try to fit really weird solutions to these really red things. Um, so we do actually have multiple sets of templates that you could compare. Um, I don't, I'm not convinced that we get the precision on the ages that would be needed to make a sort of Hubble tension-like um, argument for some of these things. You don't get the 10%. Uh, there's a lot of systematics in our stellar population modeling that are much bigger than 10%. Um, I see Ben nodding aggressively. <laughs> Even if you do averaging over, or over priors or whatever, you can't get to 10%. I, well, the problem is, is really the systematic differences um, that you don't have a great constraint on. Um, so like I was saying at the beginning, there's really a, a huge amount of things that go into these models. It's like all of star formation, <laughs> you know, for example. Um, and so I think it would be an interesting test to do. I just don't know that you could get the precision. Like, you can't necessarily believe the answer you would get out because it could be different by a factor of three. For each galaxy, but then average over the population. Well, but you're using the same template set for it's everything. A it's a systematic thing, yeah. But it is an interesting plot to make, and I should, I should do it just to see. Yeah. I think... You mentioned that there was a triply lensed yeah. galaxy. I didn't catch it. Can you yes. just show yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. <coughs> um, I only showed one image here, um, but it is this, yeah, which this thing. Guys? Yeah, so this is, this is the prettiest image of them. Um, but where are the three lensed? Uh, so, this, so this entire thing is also lensed two other times. Uh, that I'm not showing here. Well separated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there examples of uh, triply lensed anything? Because typically we see two or four. Yeah, there might be additional images that there are behind. Be. There must be. Um, sorry, it's at least triply imaged. Okay. I have found three of them, or at least Lucas Furtak, who's doing our lensing models, has found three of them. Um, there probably must be a fourth one. Probably, um, yeah. But they're at uh, one of the, so this is the cleanest image in that it's farthest away from the foreground cluster galaxies. Um, at least one of the other images is like almost completely behind uh, a foreground cluster galaxy, so you can't like see it very well. So I would guess that the fourth is lurking somewhere in but the Has ICL. anybody made a model of the lensing? Yes. And so that's they actually, can predict where other images might be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is being led by um, Adi Zitrin and Lucas Furtak. Um, and so this is actually now one of the clusters that we have the most spectroscopic redshifts in. And so uh, they're trying to rerun the lensing map right now, the lensing modeling, um, including these new like 700 spectroscopic redshifts from Uncover, and it broke their computer. Like it just like absolutely crashed the memory because they're not used to having more than like a dozen spexies in a cluster. Um, so they're, so we should actually get really precise constraints. And the thing that's really interesting from the cluster standpoint is that then I understand that you can do some really interesting dark matter modeling of the cluster. Um, with that lensing model um, and sort of build on that and yeah, predict the images, um, all of these multiply lensed images. Uh, the cluster is a mess though. So this is uh, ABLE 2744 is the Hubble frontier field that has the largest area of high magnification. And that's because it's not actually a single cluster. It's like multiple clusters that are merging. So we have at least three different cluster cores that are in our JW imaging and the potential is just like an absolute mess. So, okay. Yeah. Long answer. Good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you.
Good. Great talk, thanks. Thank um, you. I was wondering uh, the high Z sources uh, yeah. from the uncover survey uh, yeah. because they are uh, behind the cluster region. Mm -hmm. I was wondering like how many are affected by the weak lensing and mm -hmm. if they look like weak lensing shears, um, would it be a problem when you are getting like aperture photometry or are you getting like non aperture photometry? Mm. Yeah, so the very so the very high redshift sources, if, if I sort of understand correctly the idea or the question that you're asking is about what if things are, are strongly lensed into arcs and is your photometry bad? Um, so all of the very high redshift sources, we have, I think we have like three redshift greater than 12 things that are spectroscopically confirmed. Those are all point sources, um, even, even with the lensing boost. And so our photometry is fine for those. There are a bunch of like very close to the cluster giant arcs. Um, and those, like, there is no hope of doing just simple aperture photometry. You have to make little banana apertures that are specially molded to every single galaxy. Um, and so most of those are flagged in our catalog as, like, y you should investigate this separately. <laughs> Don't use these fluxes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ryan. Great talk. Um, you showed these galaxies that were old and yeah. had dusty centers. So the dust yeah. implies some presence of gas yes. uh, that is not forming stars, or uh, do you have a sort of interpretation of that? Yeah, yeah, so this is, a, this is a really interesting question about what happens to the dust to gas ratio as galaxies die. Um, and so normally uh, people just assume, a, I think it's like 100 dust to gas ratio. Um, uh, and it turns out, so Kate did a, Kate Whitaker has a paper where she looked in the simulations, um, and it turns out there's this giant spread in dust to gas ratio, right, as galaxies are quenching. Um, and it doesn't seem to be very obviously just a time scale thing. It's kind of just, they're all doing something weird as they quench. Um, and so there's these exotic dust to gas ratio predictions. Um, I don't think anybody, including Deshika, whose simulations they are, entirely believes that this is true. And so we have um, actually a program um, in Squiggle, which is a low redshift survey of post-starburst galaxies. We have CO measurements for about 50 of these galaxies that have just stopped forming stars. Um, and we are currently are getting ALMA data for the dust, so we can try and understand the dust to gas ratio. Um, but it probably evolves really rapidly, we think, as they're quenching, but I don't know. Um, there was one slide that was like a grid like this that had these yeah. galaxy that had these like three dots or like a beads almost. I'll just here. I'll just flip through and uh, tell me when you're. Yeah. Uh, any of these? No, I think it's further. Um, maybe one. Of yeah, these that guys? one. Yeah. 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 It's the second row. I kind of just yeah. wanted to see it again, but like, do <laughs> yeah. you like know? I mean, are they are they like? I guess you know the projected distance, but are they like into or out of? Do we know the three D distance or um, why it looks like this? No, or? this is a this is a half arc second scale bar at redshift four point five. So if you can do cosmology in your head, you can do a kiloparsec conversion. I can barely do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't either. I was like, I'm standing in front of people. I'm not going to try and do math in my head. That is going to go very poorly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so my, my assumption is that this is like a, like an edge on system and you're seeing the core and then that, and maybe it's, maybe that dark part is a dust lane. I don't know. That's kind of high redshift. Maybe it's also just a merger. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be an AGN. I think, uh, well it has, it looks like the center has a higher O2 to H alpha ratio. Um, so maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Because, like, I don't know. I mean, I can't think of anything in the local universe that looks like this. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I agree with you, and that's part of why I'm so excited about this data, is that I think uh, a lot of the work that we've done as a community in understanding the spatially resolved properties of galaxies, like, there's things like fangs, which are, like, beautiful, glorious detail of things that are very old in the very local universe, right? And so we're seeing things in the act of forming now and being able to do these spatially resolved observations. So it's kind of like a whole, I don't know, it's, it's exciting as an observer. It feels like a whole new frontier. How certain is it, is it that 
these are not multiple images? Um, these are definitely not multiple images given where they are in the, in the lensing, um, and they're all definitely at the same redshift. Um, I, I looked at all of these, and the, the slit is actually going that way on the spectrum for that spexy. Nice. Uh, with this immediate band images, and mm -hmm. you start to say that, but marginally resolve the emission ice. Yeah. In, I didn't see any goal of to analyze the emission ice map and the like the BPT like things. Here. Yeah. So, so sorry. Uh, what's your expectation on this? Because you sh probably will have some very large uncertainty here, mm -hmm. but it, it might give you some hint because 60,000 galaxies is a huge sample. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so I think um, specifically the BPT diagram is really hard because they were chosen to be lines that are very close to each other so that you can do the spectral calibration, right? And so, like for example, most of our galaxies, we are not separately resolving H beta and O3. Um, the plus side is that we have GRISM observations for everything, and in some of those you can, you can resolve the lines. Um, like you can resolve the, the O3 doublet, that's like kind of the whole point of their GRISM survey. And so I think we can't do that with the medium band data alone, but we might be able to once we calibrate how to do it with higher resolution spectra. Um, so that's something on the list of like basically asking, can we make those types of measurements even with large uncertainties from the medium band imaging? And if so, what do you have to assume and how do you have to do the modeling? And I think, again, this is a really great field to try and understand that because we have so much data to calibrate against and see if you get the right answer. Um, but we haven't done it yet. <laughs> if you want to do it, the data is all public. Oh, I, I should have mentioned our, so the data is immediately public. Um, I wanted to have the survey paper out by this talk, but I didn't because that's how that's how these things go, um, but it'll probably be on the archive like next week. And so all of the data, and then all of our reduced data products as well, so our, our photometric catalog and all of our uh, redshifts and all of our stellar pops will all be on the internet as of like next week on our website. More questions? A few more minutes. Okay, I can ask a couple. Yeah, no uh, So is the statistics good enough to sort of build uh, evolutionary sequence, observational yes. evolution sequence for mm -hmm. how, how far can we can we go? Like what's, what's the ratio of range? Oh yeah, well, so you get, I mean, you get coverage of different features at different ranges. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have a redshift distribution of just what our photo Zs in the whole thing are. Um, but basically we're getting strong features all the way from, from the cluster itself, um, all the way basically to redshift 12 is our highest. Oh, I mean, I mean, uh, sort of to build a rough idea of how individual galaxies can evolve in this. Mm. So essentially, if you yeah, see it like a rush two, if you see uh, like uh, ancestors of galaxies that you see at rush yeah. four, six or Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we have a couple of people working on that. In particular, John Weaver is really interested in Milky Way progenitors at like redshift two or three. Mm. So he's doing some sort of fancy like number count smashing um, approaches to try and identify what those look like in the survey. Um, and he's found quite a few. Um, so, yeah, I guess this is maybe not the best like discussion topic talk because it's mostly like look at our cool data and all the science we're going to do, but we haven't yet done the science, and that's because we've yeah only had the data for a couple months. I actually have another question about the spatially resolved study of the yeah, first Quiescent Galaxy. Yeah. Um, I was actually really surprised to say that, uh, that it has a really old core. Yeah. Because I thought like massive Quiescent Galaxies at high redshifts are all expected to be post starbursts. And mm -hmm. if the starbursts happen in the central region, it would have younger cores. Yeah. But um, if it has an old core, um, so it didn't have starbursts in the past, how do you think it could have formed such a high stellar mass at, in the such young universe. Yeah, well, so the core is, is a similar age to the outskirts, I think, in this, in this galaxy. I don't know if we actually plotted it. We, we did plot it for this one. So this is another example, and you can see the core and the outskirts are actually like approximately the same age. It's just mostly a difference in dust. And so I think that the, the scenario that you're proposing of basically having a dust-obscured starburst in the center um, is entirely possible for some of these things um, still. I think I was surprised that there was so much dust in the core of this thing. 
um, once you look, because the global photometry of these things, they do look, I mean, this one is a little bit older looking, but like David's galaxy looks really post-starburst. And then you look at the core and it's super dusty. Uh, I was super surprised by this, and then I was talking to people to try and figure this out, and apparently when they were looking at all the data from NMBS, which was like a ground-based uh, medium band survey back in the day, there was also a lot of these galaxies that somebody wrote three quarters of a paper of and pulled up like a PDF of a paper that they never submitted about how the aperture photometry in the center was really dusty. Um, so I guess, you know, we have some text to start writing from. Um. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, yeah. So I was wondering, and probably the answer is no, since you've only had the data for yeah. a couple of months, <laughs> uh, but have you looked at any uh, sort of like galaxy scaling relation type things just to see if these high redshift galaxies are like weird in some way systematically? Yeah, so not yet, and part of the not yet is that cluster fields are really hard um, because we're probing a very small area um, intrinsically, um, and then, yeah, everything is is kind of, complicated because of that. Um, so if you just plot like our redshift distribution, there's all these weird fake peaks um, that are just because we're a really small cluster field. Um, so, so Joel Lija is working on understanding the, the basically star forming mean sequence and the, and the mass function. Um, and he's doing a lot of very fancy modeling. <laughs> and so it's sort of a in progress thing. Um, yeah. Cool, excited to hear about it. Yeah. So, so you and Gus brought up this idea that these things look different than what we yeah. see in the local universe. And is there, and, and also very complicated and mm -hmm. clumpy, is there some way that we can think about matching these, to, you know, some sort of idea of what these early chaotic phases of galaxy formation might look like? Mm -hmm. Is there summary statistics or some, some way that we can? Yeah compare constraints, I guess. Um, I feel like there should be, but I don't think we've developed that yet, right? Like, I mean, you can do something like, um, you know, like in the local universe, they do like the spatially resolved chaos relation and then compare to the global. And so you could imagine doing something similar where you look at like the spatially resolved like star formation versus mass and compare to the global. Um, so that's like an option. Uh, I don't think it's the best option because it's not like you said a summary statistic. So I actually, I don't know if anybody has suggestions for like summary statistics, especially ones that would be robust to like compare between ob observations and theory. I think that we need those. Um, I would certainly use them if somebody came up with them. Um, but I don't know what they should be. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think these, these complicated morphologies at high redshift are an interesting yeah. comparison point with, with simulations if we can make them. Yeah, I mean the the thing to like note, I didn't I didn't mention this, but like uh, right, the way that we normally fit galaxy sizes is with Cersic profiles, and uh, you will notice not a single one of these looks like a smooth Cersic profile, right? And so like we clearly need to be moving towards these more non-parametric measures of of galaxy size and galaxy morphology, and I think this is a really rich field that we have a lot to do with with kind of understanding what the best way to do that is. Maybe this idea, maybe my idea is wrong, but when people first look at the galaxies at ratio two, mm -hmm. um, we also see some clumpy structures and looks exactly what we are looking at at ratio four. Mm -hmm. So, is there any lessons we can learn from the previous study at ratio two? But now we know that they are not that kind of clumpy. There are some underlying structures. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's part of the problem is that um, there. I, my understanding of like the redshift two literature when it comes to clumps is that like the HST view was like all the clumps are a kiloparsec and there's no obvious stellar mass underlying them. And then when you look at them with JWST, you're like, oh, a kiloparsec was the resolution limit. They're actually much smaller, and then you can see all the stellar mass underlying them. So I I don't feel like I have a good understanding of the like our observational just because this is like a little bit outside of my field of like what we have done to parameterize this at, at Redshift 2 that we think is like super robust in terms of the modeling. And again, like what's the summary statistic? Um, but we should chat more because I want to hear more. I can ask another one if no one else wants. Uh, so, okay, and 
apart from morphology, like more like zero for yeah. statistics, like uh, do they work out for, for example, what, what are the masses of this galaxy? Are they massive enough to produce this, that enough, mm -hmm. that much dust? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're still, um, so the prospector catalog is still running to get the stellar masses. We have stellar masses from EZ right now, but I don't, I don't trust them. Uh -huh. um, and what are the lowest masses you find there? The lowest masses that we find. Um, I mean, we're probing quite faint things. So I think the, the actual lowest mass things that we find is like an absolutely astonishing number of globular clusters in mm. ABLE 2744. Mm. Um, and so those are, I don't know, glo globular cluster mass, like 10 to the 5. Is that, that seems right, order of magnitude? I see nods. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so those are the lowest mass systems mm -hmm. that we have. Um, and we actually are seeing there's quiescent galaxies even out to redshift uh, 2 that have globular clusters around them. Um, so this was an IFU proposal in cycle 3 that was led by Sam Cutler, who's a grad student, um, who found this uh, yeah, quiescent galaxy at redshift 2.5 that has like a dozen things that look like globulars around them. Um, but we, to get the masses right, we really wanted spectroscopy for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any more or less questions? Oh, okay, I think we can end here. Awesome. It's almost an hour. Yeah, let's thank one again. Yeah, thank you.